British author Patrick Watts has published a new book called The End of the American Empire, in which he warns that unless some of the issues that beset our country today are resolved, the American empire will collapse. What lies ahead for our country unless changes are made? Watts writes that the wounds of the past cannot be healed through ignoring the fact they ever occurred, but neither through an endless cycle of guilt, apology, and revenge. In an increasingly divisive, fraught political climate full of hyperbole, accusation, and online echo chambers, the American people need to remember who they are and why they've ruled the world for almost a century. He says that with the possible return of Donald Trump to the presidency, the lessons of this book must be learned now. So stay with us. Welcome to Lean to the Left, home of no-holds-barred commentary, plus interviews with fascinating people, some of them top experts, others simply with interesting stories to tell. You'll never know who will show up at Lean to the Left, now, here's your host, Bob Gaddy. Patrick's based in London and joins us from there today. With degrees in history and international relations, he's a nonpartisan observer eager to help Americans navigate what he believes is a crucial and perilous moment in our nation's history. Patrick's book addresses the current climate as the country gears up for the election arguing that the United States is best described as an empire. He lays out the historical, political, social, geopolitical reasons why the American empire might collapse sooner rather than later, with huge domestic and global consequences. Patrick, that's a lot, but thanks for joining us today to discuss it. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The first question I have to ask you is this. You're British. Why did you focus on the U.S. and how are you qualified to do so? Yeah, that's a question I anticipate fielding a lot. And I think qualified to do, so, I'd say on a personal level, I'm a big, you know, I like America a lot. I've been to America many times. I see myself more as a kind of a concerned friend looking on from the outskirts and seeing essentially going down a path that I don't think is, is all too productive. So that's my personal reason I'm trying to lend a hand to try and raise some issues as I see them. I think on a professional level, obviously doing a degree in history is, is helpful. But mm -hmm. when I did my master's degree in international relations and contemporary warfare, and then my dissertation specifically studying Donald Trump and the efforts that he made consciously and potentially subconsciously to alter kind of norms of global and domestic behavior of what is acceptable and what isn't. And since doing that, I feel like I've been plugged into the to the U.S. and the, the issues that you guys are facing for well for about four or five years now. <laughs> so wait a minute, did you just say that you did your dissertation on Donald Trump? I did. That was at the end of his presidency, and I actually I remember writing in the dissertation that if we weren't uh, awake to what was going on, and if we all just celebrated saying, "Oh, Trump's gone," that's that. Um, then we'd be here again. And that's exactly what's going on. And I think even in the preface of the book, I say this is, I don't blame Donald Trump for everything. I think he's a symptom of the fact that the system itself is completely corrupted. And it's created uh -huh. the conditions that allow somebody like Trump, who has, in my view, all of the worst kind of possible aspects of his character to be a president, but it allows the conditions for him to rise. And I think that's yeah on both parties. Absolutely. That's incredible. What do you believe is causing the decline in the American empire? I think there is an undercurrent of kind of the toxic influence of, of money in every kind of system that it shouldn't be involved in. So if you look at democracy, the link between kind of finance and campaign donations and things like that is pretty staggering. You're never going to have a situation where everything is completely objective and honest if your politicians are allowed to take donations from everybody. Mm -hmm. I think we, as part of a, a bit of a newsletter campaign, we were actually comparing the cost of different elections from 1960 all the way up to 2020. And then we were looking at how many nurses' salaries you could actually uh, pay for using the equivalent that's, in my view, wasted on this constant electioneering. 
it's about, I think now it's of 2020, it's about 170,000 nurses salaries is wasted on that kind of election cycle, which is pretty staggering. And then if you actually think these, these kind of donors, these super PACs and all the rest of it, they're not giving money because they just, they, they like the candidate. They're giving money because they want influence when their chosen candidate enters power. Yeah. So I think that is, in terms of the democratic side of things, I think that's a big problem. I think if you look in more simple terms, I call it unhinged capitalism, like the purest form of capitalism means that if then if the only thing that really matters is shareholder return and profit, you're going to lead to this huge disconnect and this massive state of inequality, which is, I think inequality is at the, the base of everything that's wrong with the American empire at the moment, because it's ostensibly you're the richest country in the world. If you take away tax dependencies in Luxembourg and places like that, mm. yet you've got people stealing uh, baby formula because they can't afford it. You've got people wandering into malnutrition. You've got people, as many people dying from opioids, homicides, suicides as well, 450,000 a year. It's 10 times 9-11. There's so many issues which I think are ignored because if you were to criticize America, then you are not patriotic. And I think being obviously not American, that lends me some, maybe a slight advantage because I know I'm not patriotic to Americans, so I'm not American. So I feel like I can actually sure. maybe lend a bit more of an unbiased opinion. Yeah, you mentioned a lot of things, and one of them that resonated mostly with me is the talk about really greed. In my opinion, what's wrong with this country is that greed is the predominant factor that controls so much. Absolutely. I think it's, I think the problem as well is it's not just controls America. America yeah. has an outsized influence on the rest of the world and has done ever since the end of Second World War when the British Empire collapsed and America took over. And that that kind of greed-driven model has infiltrated every aspect of the global system. And I think that's the problem. It's everybody is put, every, well, profit is put above everything else. And you look at the, I think it's hypocrisy at the end of the day as well. Like people don't like hypocrisy. And if you look at kind of the bailouts in 2008, you look at the bailouts for COVID and they were used to fund things like share buyback schemes. And on the one hand, I think Robert Wright talks a lot about it. He says you've got pure, raw, cruel capitalism for the poor and you've got socialism for the rich because a bailout is not capitalism. I think this is the problem. It is there's so much greed and there is so much kind of money involved that it's, yeah, it's, it's in every aspect of the system. When you talk about hypocrisy, I don't want to blame everything on MAGA, on, on the MAGA people. But to me, they suck in, or they just buy into all the hypocrisy that is coming down from Donald Trump and his Republican backers. Yeah, I think, again, there's both parties are to blame. I think personally, I don't like Donald Trump. I, I, again, I think he's thin skinned, capricious, cruel. Um, I, I, I feel like a lack of compassion is one of the main problems in, mm -hmm. in America and the world. And yeah. I think he exemplifies that. So there's obviously hypocrisy within the Republican Party hiding behind desks on the 6th of January and then now saying it was just a tourist visit, things like that. Lindsey exactly. Graham came up immediately afterwards saying, enough, we've got to get rid of him. And then now he's kissing the ring. But I think there's hypocrisy abound on both sides as well. You look at the main kind of election strategy of the Democrats, this cycle seems to be, again, simply just not being Donald Trump. And that's not good enough. You have to give people something to... The reason Obama was in elected and re-elected was because it was he was advertising hope. He was advertising something you wanted to vote for, not just vote against. Mm -hmm. And I think the problem that the Democrats have is maybe ever since they picked kind of Kamala Harris as the VP, they've had this kind of this succession problem. And because they shouldn't be running Joe Biden because they know realistically he's probably not going to make it through the next term or there's there should be better candidates, but they're giving voters, voters this kind of forced choice. It's a case of if you don't like Donald Trump, which many of them don't, obviously, it's like, well, you have to go with Biden then. And if I saw some talk about maybe him even being replaced at delegation by superdelegates, if that happens, then that's dreadful for hypocrisy, because quite rightly, the Democrats are calling out the, the threat to democracy that is Donald Trump, who tried to stay in power and all of what we all know about. 
If you then do the same type of thing and parachute in a chosen candidate, that's hypocrisy again. And I think, yeah, this is why Trump is anywhere near the presidency again. It's because people are sick of hypocrisy and they just, I don't think a lot of people want to vote for Donald Trump. Every time I meet people in America, they don't tell me how much they love Donald Trump. Yeah, no, I know there's a, it's a real problem because there are a, a lot of people, including in the Democratic Party, who would very much like it if there was another candidate besides Joe Biden with his age and so on. But I think the guy's getting the bum rap, too. I think he's done a, a really good job on many issues, despite the headwinds that he has to face. And I don't know how. I'm the same age he is. He's 81 years old. So am I. I cannot, for the life of me, fathom how he does what he does at his yeah. age. And, I, and I agree with you 100%. And I, I think he gets a bum rap purely because he's running again. If you actually look at you know, his numbers previously and what he actually has achieved, if he said halfway through, I'm going to be a one-term president and I'm going to pass it on, I think he would end up, would have gone down in history as one of the better presidents. But because it feels because he's seeing it as this kind of crusade to keep Donald Trump out and that he's potentially mm -hmm. the only person that can do it, that I think that's what's leading to his unpopularity. Because yeah, yeah I feel like he has got quite a lot done and he has tried to lean across the aisle I think the problem is bipartisanship is is dead at the moment. It's, it's just simply seems impossible. Yeah. So yeah, I agree with you. But yeah, if I was, you know, put it when I'm when I'm his age, the last thing I'd want to be doing is is, is running a country or doing what he's doing. Oh my he's, God! And the guys running all over the world doing all this stuff, and at the same time he's facing all this crap from everybody. He should be going home and playing with his grandkids and. Yeah, he should have his feet up. <laughs> yeah. Jeez, what was that? Golf, I don't know. Do some surfing. <laughs> just, uh, just, yeah. yeah. Not maybe running the most uh, powerful country in the world. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned, though, that Kamala Harris. Are you saying that, that she's a problem? Is that what you're saying? I think if we go back to when that decision was made, I think there was a large kind of argument for representation and the idea was we should there should be a black female who is chosen as vp mm -hmm. which again i don't disagree with that as a premise it's good to represent that just that does not make you a good candidate and i think that's what they're finding out now stacy abrams potentially would have been better for that role if we're looking at it that way mm -hmm. there are females there are black females it's just to try and choose somebody specifically for that metric and nothing else has left them in a bit of a predicament because if she was much more popular I, I can't see a situation where he would be running again. The problem is because she's not, I think that's why they're in the situation that they are. I think one of the problems is that I don't think he's given her a whole lot to do that would keep her in the forefront of the news. You don't hear much he about there. her. You never really do, though, unless the VP is doing a dreadful job. I can't remember the quote. I was reading it the other day, but someone said it's not one of the old presidents saying it wasn't worth a um, glass of piss or something like that. It's, it's a pointless exercise. Are you, um, are you old enough to remember Dan Quayle? I know the name, but I was, I was not old enough to have uh, remembered him at the time. <laughs> when Dan Quayle was vice president, I had to go to the White House to, oh, to interview him for one of my magazines that I wrote for. And he was known for being stupid. And <laughs> I was walking across the parking lot behind the White House, and he came out to greet me, along with his a couple of staff people. And this Secret Service station wagon came roaring around the corner. And I grabbed him and... <laughs> pulled on his jacket and I said, Mr. Vice President, you're going to get run over. And, and he goes, oh, wow, thanks. <laughs> wow. It, it was just one of those moments that I won't forget that one. Did that uh, fill you with confidence about the ability <laughs> of the man? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so you use the term American empire. Why do you call it an empire? I think because regardless of what people might wish to think, it, it clearly is. It is one. What pre-British Empire, and maybe during some parts of the British Empire, the idea of empire itself 
was something that wasn't to be feared and nobody, nobody, it was something to be proud of. The sensibilities have changed quite rightly. We've moved away from this idea of conquering and oppressing everybody, but it's throughout history, that is what empire has been. So America has, has overtly not set out to do that and has not advertised itself as doing that. However, it has an outsized influence over every other nation in the world. Um, since the end of the, the, the Cold War, there hasn't essentially been a, another power that's had anywhere near parity with it. Um, militarily, the US spends 10 times more. So it spends the same amount as 10, the next 10 countries combined on the military. The UK used to have a two power standard. That was the rule. The UK spent more than the next two. The US is 10. So these are elements of empire. When you then look at the control of the global money supply, you have the dollar as the reserve currency, you have the World Bank and the IMF, you have NATO and the UN lesser extent now essentially functioning as a further military arm of that global American influence. So I think, and that's actually if you don't even look at the commercial side of things and the exportation of the American dream through Hollywood, um, it means it's in it's everywhere. And mm-hmm. it's been an incredible PR kind of coup to present it as completely benign and not looking to oppress while also look at the actions in south and central america in the 80s you have also the camp cambodia vietnam etc iraq afghanistan these are the type of actions that an empire carries out and also if you look at even a more recent example look at the drone program imagine alexander the great or genghis khan having the ability to assassinate anybody on the planet at any time that's that is empire which whichever way we call it And I think one of the most important things, which is why I tackle this really early on in the book, is it's important to address that, see it for what it is, so that you can look at the parallels from these other empires that have called themselves that, so that we can then say, okay, if these are the issues, how do we fix them? And I don't think that, I feel like America is an empire in its infancy. I don't think that this is necessarily leading to the end, but I think it needs to mature and it needs to move on to an empire led by compassion rather than what's happening now, which is completely not, certainly not compassion, it's selfishness, like you said, and greed. Yeah, greed, racism, yeah, and so on. But why do you believe the American empire should be prolonged then? That's a really good question, and that's one I actually struggled with quite a lot when I was writing it, because there's... There's a section where I'm essentially listing quite a lot of the misdeeds that I feel like a lot of people might not necessarily know about, like some of the ones I've just mentioned. And I'm thinking to myself, even as I'm writing that, hang on, these don't sound like positive things. Why do I actually want this to continue? And I guess the point is, if you look at the most viable alternative to American kind of superiority or hegemony, it's not Western democracies. It's autocratic. It's the Chinese model. Now, nobody who's lived in a free society wants to live in a surveillance state like that. And I think if you look at what America has going for it, it's if you take the politicians aside, I'm going to okay, generalize there, but the majority of the politicians, as I see it, aside, the American people themselves, I think, you know, they at their heart, they believe in these lofty rhetoric, these ideals of freedom and equality and things like that. I think unlike many other kind of nation states that is still that founding myth is still endures so i think there is the potential there to lead the world into a more equitable multipolar way moving forward but only if certain massive changes are made because at the moment this model this hyper capitalism this greed this selfishness it's it's the opposite of what it needs to be so you think the American political model is destined to fail? I think there's parts of it that are in desperate need of repair. I think mm-hmm. if you look, there's some of the archaic systems in there that are just simply not fit for purpose. Things like the Electoral College, as we all saw with Mike Pence being essentially tried to force by Donald Trump to change votes. All of this, it's, it's, it's a system that needs to be revised. I think, look at the filibuster. To any, I actually quite, had quite a lot of fun writing about that because to anybody who's not American, looking in and, you know, watching the filibuster in action is absolutely ludicrous. If I just waste everybody's time, then that it's means horrible. that we just don't vote on something. And I think I was reading, is it Strom Thrumgood who had the, the record for the longest, just 24 hours that he filibustered, essentially just talking bollocks to try and put off a vote on the civil rights. 
how is that a model of good governance? It's and also if you compare it to the Chinese model, not in terms the Chinese model is not one to be aimed at at all. However, they are able to plan for decades, whereas with the American model, you're planning for two year election cycles, and then there's so much money and influence that nothing is is coherent. Somebody comes in. Trump said it himself on the campaign trail. The, the beauty of executive orders is you just get rid of the executive orders of the chap before you.、Mm-hmm. So none of this is a coherent way of of ruling a country, and that's before we even talk about the Supreme Court, which has been stacked full of conservatives. That's been a thirty forty year play to move that to the right, and then only recently they've had to try to build in some kind of eth- way of actually maintaining some ethics because you got people like. Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito. It's there's so many problems in there, and most of the time, I think the public kind of ignore what happens within the Supreme Court because they've got millions of other things to do. But when it comes to Roe versus Wade, that is huge, and eventually people will turn around and say, "Hang on, like, who is this working for? None, none of this is working for me. I didn't agree to any of this." Exactly. Yeah, I've had in the last. Couple months, I've had I don't know how many, probably three guests on my podcast who have predicted in one way or another another American civil war resulting from all the chaos that's currently taking place and the hate and the divisiveness. What do you think about that? I think it's a tragedy that it's got to a situation where that is what many people are thinking and saying. I don't think they're a million miles from the truth, but I also think it's something that's thrown around and shouldn't be maybe used flippantly because nobody, obviously, in America today was around for the first civil war. But a civil war is a tragedy, and it is a the a modern American civil war would be very different to the previous one. It'd be more guerrilla actions and targeted assassinations and things like that.、Mm-hmm. But it's still a dreadful scenario. I think everything that needs should be done to try and avoid that, and I think. A part of what I'm trying to do with this book is just to. There's a lot of kind of harsh realities in there. It's to try and wake people up a little bit and say, "You guys are all Americans, and you've moved away from that." In my views, in the last maybe fifteen, twenty years, going from being Americans to being Democrats and Republicans. There's a really good book actually, Matt Taibbi called Hate Inc., and it was all about how essentially the media realized that there were no credible en- enemies outside of you guys after after the two thousands. So essentially, just Got everybody to hate each other. So supporting your political party became like supporting your football team or your your NBA team. So I think that has been manufactured and engineered. So this kind of this hatred, this these divisions, which are far more, I think, yeah, far more manufactured than they are in reality. I don't think if you if I speak to most Republicans or most Democrats, they don't want to go and shoot at shoot the other side. But the way that things are progressing, it may well lead to that, which again would be a disaster. What parallels、uh, have you observed with the end of the previous empires with the current situation in the U.S.? So, interestingly, I'll ask you a question. So, what do you think is the biggest threat to? How do you think most empires end? Most people would tend to think. If I, China, for instance, what's the biggest threat to America? China. That's usually what people will think because it's a, it's an obvious, it's a military power. Is a, I can see what it. It's a confrontation. They're on the rise. No, that's how we end. Most empires don't actually end the specifically because of、uh, a challenger rising up. They actually end because they either overexpand, be it militarily or financially, it leads to economic collapse, or they descend into kind of civil war and chaos and. The key kind of pinch points that where most of those civil wars occur is all to do with what I've deemed succession legitimacy. So the idea you know, back in you know, the olden days, if you look at say, yeah, look at the, the Mongols. When Genghis Khan died, he was such a powerful leader. Before he died, he he cut up his empire into four with his four sons、uh, had individual khanates that they were ruling. But without him at the helm, everything descended into chaos.、Mm-hmm. And then again, you see these times of succession. You you need. The, the succession to be legitimate, and the、okay. problem for the U.S. is because both parties seem to be kind of denigrating, I'd, I'd say, democracy and not treating it with the respect it deserves. This idea that democracy wasn't as、uh, invincible as we might think. Then, when obviously Bernie Sanders was、uh, 
quite screwed, is, is the best way of putting it, so that he was not going to be chosen as the, uh, the candidate because Hillary was the anointed one. Again, then following that, obviously you had Hillary's loss to Trump. And I think that would have been a useful come to Jesus moment for the Democrats to have a real good look at themselves. Why did we lose? And instead of doing that, they just blamed Russia. And I'm not saying there's no smoke without fire. And there obviously was interference. But that wasn't the takeaway message. The takeaway message should have been, hang on, people don't like the fact that we put up a candidate. We've actually got rid of a perfect, a progressive candidate who's actually for the people. And we just installed who we want. And then obviously that leads inexorably to, to Trump calling out the big lie and fake all of the lies that he created around the election. Yeah. You were talking about China. Do you believe China is the biggest threat to the United States? Uh, apart from the U.S. itself, I said it's <laughs> the biggest external threat. Um, yeah. But also, if you look at China historically, China's always practiced strategic patience. Again, it def depends how we define threat to the U.S. I don't think that China is about to attack the mainland U.S. anytime soon, if ever. Also, as we said, militarily, the U.S. is so much stronger than China. I don't think they intend to do that. I think they intend to flex their muscles around their own backyard, so to speak. And that's what we're seeing with building in the South China Sea and all the tensions obviously around Taiwan, which is going to be a, a potential huge flashpoint, I don't know, in the next couple of years, it seems. But yeah, I don't see them directly attacking the US. I don't see, there's no need for that. So mm -hmm. I don't see what, what win there is there for them. It, mm -hmm. Again, it brings us back a little bit to that question of empire. The days of launching a war of conquest seem to be behind us. And I know you, you could mention Russia, Ukraine. I say Russia, Ukraine, and also potentially China, Taiwan, they would be more, they're all, they're advertised as, I don't know, denazification and, and whatever nonsense Putin's talking about over there. But it's righting the wrongs as they see it of historical boundaries. It's not Russia marching into Britain or Russia marching into America. So the idea that China would sail their fleet over to the US and start landing troops in New York or something, I, th I think it's ludicrous. It's, it's just not going to yeah, happen. Yeah, okay. We've talked a lot of, about a lot of stuff, but we haven't really talked a great deal about your book. Is there anything, are there any points you'd like to make to tell us what about that? I think the takeaway point would bring me back to what you asked at the beginning about where, why I've written it and what, what makes me uh, qualified to do. Mm -hmm. I think the, I'm just trying to engender some positive change and some positive discussion. And I think one of the key themes that come, come to, well, hopefully will come away from it is that if anybody disagrees with the things that I'm writing, and obviously they will, and I hope they do, then they should remember that it's been written from a place of love. And I want to just have some conversations rather than just hurling abuse one way or another. I think that's completely irrelevant. And I think that towards the end of the book, we touch on this. I feel like the idea of human nature has been hijacked and needs to be needs to evolve a little bit. I think it's kind of reductionist. Everyone just says, oh, it's just human nature. We're going to we're going to always fight each other. That's just human nature, mm -hmm. which I think is such a cop out. If you actually Owen Laszlo talks a bit about this. So, um, so does Michael Carlberg. So the idea of human nature being this kind of dog eat dog, this zero sum mentality, I think it's completely it's completely backward thinking. It just leaves us no room to evolve as a species. It's a, like putting a marker in the sand and saying, oh, that's all we are. We're just we're just animals. And we're never going to change. Actually, if you look at there's a there's an experiment, which it might be apophical. I'm not really sure. David Attenborough gets misquoted as having said it, but to do with kind of red ants and black ants. You put them in a terrarium. They absolutely get along just fine until you shake it up. And then suddenly they're at each other's throats. And I think that's the point here is that we globally, we could feed everyone, we could house everyone, we could all have everything that we need, but we choose not to. And we choose to allow ourselves to be detached from the suffering of other human beings because of the other. They don't look like us, therefore we can silo their suffering away. So I think that's what I'm trying to engender is a bit of conversation around what do we actually want to look like in 50, 100, 150, 200 years, provided we don't kill ourselves first which there's a very good book on that actually by Toby Ord called The Precipice, which I just finished reading, which, yeah, very much more st statistician than I am, but it looks at some pretty horrifying outcomes. But yeah, provided we can survive that, I think there's, yeah, it sounds, may, it might sound naive, but I think there is a much better world possible if we start to just think a bit bigger rather than this kind of selfish um, ignorance that we seem to be existing in right now. Okay. Is your book available now? Yeah, so it's out now. It's on audiobook, Kindle and paperback. So it's, an, okay. it's been a three-year process. So I'm very pleased to be able to uh, yeah, maybe get some weekends back. <laughs> so people can go to Amazon for it anywhere else? 
So it'll be in bookshops as well. But so, yeah, pretty much everywhere. Okay, good. Okay. Now, I know that in looking at your website, excuse me, you're involved with a number of charities, right? Yep, that's right. So we Tell me uh, the Access Project. What's that? So the Access Project, I've been helping them for a few years now. So they were created in the UK because, obviously, as you probably know, the UK has some of the best universities in the world. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, Oxford, Cambridge, um, and then the Russell Group as well. But like everywhere, unlike the US, we have a lot of social inequality. The idea behind the Access Project was to give children a chance to achieve more than they would be able to without assistance to fulfill their potential and enter these universities. What we do at the Access Project is you know, offer tutoring and mentorship and kind of assistance with kind of uh, applications and things like that so that you can get help the children from the, the most impoverished households in the country to actually fulfill their potential and enter these universities. So I've been up until this year, I had to stop this year because obviously with the book and everything, it's a bit too much, but I hope to restart in September as a history tutor for uh, for some of these children, just to try and, yeah, try and increase a bit of social mobility, really. But yeah, they're doing, they're doing some really good work. Excellent. Okay, how can people reach out to you if they want to do that to learn more? So if they go to the website, which is patrickwattsbooks.com, there's a whole section on there entitled Compassionate Change, which I guess is the kind of the initiative we're trying to drive. Then we're on all the usual socials as well. So like Instagram, Patrick Watts Books, the same on TikTok, Twitter, P. Watts Books. But yeah, we're, uh, yeah, we're, we're always trying to engage with people as much as we can. Okay, excellent. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Patrick? Not really. I think it's just this year could be quite stressful for many people, obviously, with the election coming up. Mm -hmm. And I think yeah, maybe just just take a breath and look around and realize that you guys are supposedly all in it together. That yeah. There's no need to be at each other's throats. And I think a lot of that is is manufactured and see through it a little bit. You know what? This guy may not be an American. He's British, but he sure as hell does know a lot about our country. And I think that the words that you've heard from him today are worth listening to. And I'm sure his book is worth taking a look at, which I'd like to do. So anyway, Patrick, thanks very much for joining us on our podcast. I do appreciate it very much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed this Lean to the Left video and that you found it interesting and informative. Please come back on a regular basis and check out our interviews with guests on topics that focus on progressive politics and the important social issues of our time. Our interview shows stream on Mondays and sometimes Thursdays, and you can check out upcoming shows, guests, and topics at podcast.leantotheleft.net. And you can subscribe to our interview version there and to our video shows here at YouTube. And follow us on social media, Twitter at Lean to the Left One, Instagram at Lean to the Left One, TikTok at Lean to the Left, and LinkedIn at Bob Gaddy. Now, I hope you'll support Lean to the Left too, so we can keep things going. Just click on the Donate tab at the top of the Lean to the Left Dot net homepage and contribute by buying me a cup of coffee. That'll really help and would be much, much appreciated. Now, this is Bob Gaddy signing off for Lean to the Left. Thanks for sharing your time with us.